I see new names and I also see familiar names. So welcome to everyone. I think that we will little by little start. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which forms part of the IAU global series uh, on the future of higher education. And today we have decided to vote this to devote this session to the role of gen uh, generative AI on higher education. And we look very much forward to having a conversation about the impact that we see uh, and some conversations about the opportunities, some of the challenges, and then have some thoughts about what it means for the future of higher education. To have this conversation, I'm very pleased to have three excellent speakers with me today. So um, in a little while, I'll introduce them to you, but let me just explain the format first. We are going to have this as a conversation. So we will go through a series of questions. If you have any questions from the audience, you are very welcome to post them in the Q&A function of the Zoom. I will try to monitor that one. I cannot guarantee that we'll be able to respond to all questions, but that is an opportunity. If you want to introduce yourself, you're very welcome to do so in the chat, um, but I will be monitoring questions only through the Q&A function. So welcome to everyone and looking very much forward to this exciting conversation. But for us to get started, let me then first start by introducing the three speakers that we have here today. First of all, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Didi who is a senior research fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and was for 22 years its Timothy E. Wirth Professor in Learning Technologies. His fields of scholarship includes emerging technologies, policy, and leadership. In, in 2020, Chris co-funded the Silver Lining for Learning Initiative, a webinar series that I highly recommend that you go and discover as well. And he's currently also a member of the OECD 2030 Scientific Committee and an advisor to the Alliance for, future, for the Future of Digital Learning. Chris is also a co-principal investigator and associate director for the research of the NSF-funded National Artificial Intelligence Institute in Adult Learning and Online Education. So very welcome to you, Chris. We are very pleased to have you here. Let me now turn to you, Frank. So Frank is an assistant professor of computational linguistics with, within the Center of Language and Cognition at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Previously, he was also a lecturer in computational linguistics at the Department of Artificial Intelligence in the Benulli Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence at the same institution. He holds a PhD in a degree in neuro and psycholinguistics, and his current research focuses on the use of large language models and other machine learning approaches towards investigating speech, language, and human cognition, with particular emphasis on disordered speech and languages. So Frank, as well, we are very pleased to have you as part of this conversation today. Last but not least, Kate, I'm also very pleased to introduce you and very happy that you're with us, despite the fact that you're in Australia and that it's very late on your, your, your end. So thank you for, for this effort to be able to unite those regions uh, despite the different time differences. So Kate, you're an associate professor at the Faculty of Creative Industries, Education and Social Justice in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership at Queen, Queensland's University of Technology in Australia. Kate is the leader of the Digital Learning Center for Change, a research group uh, and places focus on the processes of learning and teaching, particularly with technology. Her research is primarily focused on digital ped pedagogies, understanding complex social environmental systems, collaborative learning, the learning sciences more generally, and the development of innovative methods to inform design for learning in complex learning environments and progress towards the completion of, of a task that can be used to provide feedback to learners, instructors, designers, and researchers. So Kate, a very warm welcome to you as well. 
So I think that now that we have done the general introductions, maybe I should mention that myself, my name is Trina Jensen, and that I lead uh, our priority on digital transformation here at the IAU. And we are very excited to have this conversation on the impact of generative AI on higher education. Um, welcome to everyone. And then I think that we one of the things that we see when it comes to generative AI is that there are very different levels of understanding of what it actually means. So I think that what we're going to do is going to start kick off this conversation with the first question that is, what is generative AI and why is it creating this buzz around the impact on higher education? And Chris, I'm going to start with you, but before I give you the floor, I just want to read out um, a quote of uh, Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI behind the launch of ChatGPT, when he was asked to describe ChatGPT4, so the newest version. And he responded saying, it is slow, it is buggy, it doesn't do a lot of things very well, but neither did the first and earliest computers. And they still pointed a path to something that was going to be very important in our lives, although it took a few decades to get us there. So Chris, what is your perception of generative AI? How would you explain it in simple terms? Well, I'm happy we have multiple people here because if you have three experts on AI, you're going to hear six or seven different opinions about what it is and isn't, and we're still watching it evolve. So I'll use some analogies. Generative AI is like moonlight, and moonlight is, the moon doesn't actually have light. It reflects light from the sun. It doesn't generate its own light. And similarly, generative AI reflects things from humans uh, what's on the web, essentially, it doesn't generate its own new things. It's also then um, like a mirror, but a cloudy mirror, because the current models only have parts of what's on the World Wide Web. We know that the World Wide Web has misconceptions and myths, as well as having many strengths in terms of what it captures about knowledge. And because the web is compressed to get it into a large language model, there's also some losses that take place in that uh, condensation. So it's a cloudy mirror that reflects sort of moonlight sunlight. Another way of thinking about it is that it's a brain without a mind. So its structure is like the brain but it doesn't have a sensory system. It doesn't have consciousness. It doesn't have experiences. It's kind of like a brain in a vat all by itself. And that doesn't mean that it can't do interesting things, but it does mean that it, it's, it's not, it can't explain itself and you can't kind of interrogate it to find out why it's doing what it's doing. It's truly a black box. Uh, the other analogy I'll use is that it's like a parrot. And parrots can have an interesting vocabulary and can say a lot of things, but they don't understand the meaning of what they're saying at all. The pirate parrot that says pieces of eight has no idea that it's talking about a currency or anything other than a set of syllables that it's heard that it's repeating back. And because it doesn't understand the meaning of what it's saying, when it says something that's false, when it does what's technically called hallucinations based on how it works, uh, it doesn't understand that either. So to sum it up, it's, it's like an alien semi-intelligence. It's alien because there's nothing on this planet that thinks, in, if we can use that term about generative AI, that thinks in the way that it does. And it's a semi-intelligence because it, it's really good with language, but language is only one part of, of how we would define intelligence. Thank you very much, Chris, for explaining uh, uh, generative AI through these analogies. And what I hear I'm in the cross-cutting way of these analogies is as well the fact that it is really 
a machine and not does not hold all the same type of competences to competencies as humans. What about you, Frank? Do you agree here? Or do you have other examples of how you would explain it? You come from computer science, so you have the more technical part uh, background here. I needed to unmute myself. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm gonna pick up from where Chris left um, when he mentioned language, because that's also what I focus on. Um, and I also do believe that most of you here have um, probably the most common um, generative AI that you know is chat GPT, um, which is basically a large language model. So the way I think of large language model is that, well, it assumes that somewhere on the spectrum, there is a small or the smallest language type of model. So if you think of the smallest type of language model, um, we call it unigram. So unigram basically, um, uni means one and gram could be, um, it could be a word, it could be a syllable, it could be a letter. But in this case, let's take it to be a word. So the word hello, for example. And what the unigram type of model does is basically to say, given this document, what is the most frequent, frequently occurring word in the document? And if we know the most frequently occurring word like hello, in the document, then we do have some sort of an idea that if we are to predict the next word, it's probably going to be hello because that defines the content of the document. And then we have, if you move from the on the spectrum, you move on towards large language model, you have a, a bigram. Bigram is two words. So which basically says, given the current word um, or previous word, how can we predict the next word? And then we have trigrams. So trigrams, if you have hello ladies, um, it basically says, given this two um, sequence of words, hello ladies, how can we predict the next word, which will probably be end if you want to predict hello ladies and gentlemen. But if you think of GPT-4, for example, instead of having a unigram or a trigram or, or a bigram, it actually has 32,000 grams. So if you put it into words, it's around 24,000 words. If you put it um, in a form of a book, it's a book with a length of 48 pages with words covering each page. So what this model can do is that it can basically have all these 24,000 words, process them at the same time and use it as a context to predict the next word. So the principle here is that if it can predict the next word, it can predict the next phrase, it can predict the next sentences. And that's the reason why chat GPT is able to generate um, complex um, or long output. But what is really transformative with chat GPT has to do with something we call alignment. So the previous models, including GPT-3 itself, um, was very robotic in its output, but what OpenAI did with ChatGPT was to add human feedback into the training loop. So instead of just training um, the algorithm by exposing it to text, let's add human feedback to it so that the end output would look like something that aligns with what a human would, would predict. Um, so if you compare it with the technologies we are used to, like Google, it is not Google because Google is a document retrieval system, but um, a large language model or a generative AI is able to generate texts, um, images. Um, and I believe the next step will be videos based on next word or the next um, unit prediction. Thank you very much, Frank, for explaining that in terms that I think that many people can, can relate to. And what about you, Kate? Do you have something to add here from your perspective to this conversation about what it is all about? Um, sure. So the I think they were both great explanations. I'm going to steal some of those analogies and, and explanations the next time I have to explain it to a class. But um, one of, I think, the um, to get back to your original question about why it's generated this level of debate and interest, um, there's also alongside the um, developments in the algorithm that sits behind it and all of all of the models and everything has been the um, the way that we're able to interact with it. So there's, there was a leap in the interaction design. And so that has meant that it's now available to, it's accessible to a far wider range of people. They know how to actually interact with this um, model that's sitting behind it. Uh, all of those features of the interaction design are really um, taking into account that end user. And that's just meant that 
um, because it's so accessible and it's so interesting to um, actually interact with and you can it does um, help you be more curious and ask more questions and give feedback and engage you in that process um, that means it's more commonly used which means we all have to now know about it and figure out what to do about it thank you very much all three of you for getting us started this way so that we more or less have at least a common understanding within this room of what it is and and what it can do and some of its limitations now, when we then move to what does this tool then imply for higher education and how does it impact higher education? I think that right now, of course, we're in a phase of transition in the sense that it's relatively new. We don't have that much uh, experience in order to, to, to take informed decision based on past or previous experiences. Um, so I think that what we are seeing right now to some extent is the fact that the tool is evolving more fast than universities are actually capable of responding through policies. So in, in preparation of this webinar, I asked you all three to, to reflect on how you would advise your leadership in your institutions uh, today when it comes to, to, uh, to, to generative AI and, and these tools like ChatGPT and how it then impacts. And Kate, in this round, I would like to, to start with you. And that's also because we have seen very various responses in different parts of the world. And I know that in Australia, um, there has gone a lot of thought into redesigning assessments, uh, the impact, and I've seen even some examples of actually returning to assessments by pen and paper as a way of ensuring that there is no cheating using chat GPT. So maybe you can bring in some perspectives from the response in Australia, while then also uh, giving us some thoughts about how you would advise the leadership in your institutions in terms of dealing with uh, generative AI. So over to you, Kate. Thank you. Um, I think for the Australian context, some of this helped because um, our semester system means that our first semester for the year started sort of the end of February, beginning of March, which meant we actually did have the summer to consider a response to it in most universities. And Look, some states and universities and schools banned chat GPT. Some of that's because of age restrictions. Some of it was a reaction to um, academic integrity. So how are we going to stop people cheating? Um, and so the response was just to ban it. But I think what um, everyone's sort of come back to really is to, it's an opportunity to rethink how we're looking at assessment. So yes, absolutely. In some disciplines, it in my university, everyone was allowed to do whatever they wanted with it. We could, for our, our what, whatever we were teaching, we could ban it, we could embrace it, um, anything in that spectrum. Um, and I think in lots of ways that freedom um, meant there was a lot of uncertainty with people who didn't understand what it was and didn't understand what the potential implications could be. So it was very hard to make those decisions. And so their reaction was to just say, None of it. And yes, um, pen and paper exams, um, oral presentations, sometimes uh, direct questioning in that way. I've heard some examples of assessment um, that's being carried out. So that, but I think, I think in any rethinking of the assessment, um, and this is coming back to the advice that I give the university, it's really an opportunity to come back to what is it that we think of as learning. So what is it that we would like students to be able to demonstrate when they finish? Um, it's not so much uh, about a university as sort of stamping off that this person is qualified to do it, but what do we actually think learning is about in all of the different disciplines and how can we think of um, some authentic ways to actually assess that uh, and have that uh, in lots of ways not be as restricted as it was before. So for some of the ways that we do assessment, um, some of the ways we do testing, that's been implemented because we have to be able to do it at scale. We have to do multiple choice um, questions because we just have to do it for hundreds of students and we have to be able to market and do that fairly. So if we're rethinking how um, generative AI can help us with that, could that be the thing that's doing the testing? Um, could we be thinking about other ways so that we can get to authentic assessment of student learning? Um, at scale and I think it's 
it's just a really, um, a, it's a great opportunity. If we embrace it as an opportunity instead of a reaction to putting a whole lot of barriers around its implementation, then I think um, we could actually do some really good work out of it. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, so it is also kind of pushing us to rethink procedures and processes already in place and rethink, are these the right ones, et cetera. Frank, I know that you also form part of a group committee within the university, I think a transdisciplinary committee that has been put together within the University of Groningen in order to come up with policy advice, right, for the institution. So maybe you can share a little bit uh, on, on that as well, where you're at and what are the the type of recommendations that you're you're considering yeah um i, I think i uh, in a way to some extent i understand um with the way some institutions have reacted um to this especially those on the side of um, let's let's ban it although some of them have also reversed um their decisions as time um went on and i think the reason has to do with the fact that we were not prepared for this we we sort of thought that okay Somewhere in the future, AI is going to be able to do these kind of things, but we didn't think it was going to be now. So it came a bit as a shock. And um, for that matter, some of us reacted um, this way. But what I would say is that uh, these models, these generative AI models, they are here to stay. Um, they are here to stay in the society. So I think the way um, we as, as ed ed educationalists or we as academics need to approach this is, approach this is to sort of look at innovative ways to actually to make bet the best out of um, these tools that we we have. I think one of the uh, questions we've been thinking of is can we can we prevent students from uh, from using this? And I think the answer is no, they would use it anyway. Can we watermark it? Can we see what is coming from um, chat GPT? And at the moment, there isn't any uh, model out there which is really accurate in detecting a text from um, coming from a generative AI model and actually the, the the goal of the manufacturers of these algorithms is actually to make it more human like um, which is to make it more difficult to detect it or to classify it from from what a human wrote so i don't think that that's going to be possible in the future but i think what is what this is really doing um like what kate said um i think it's an opportunity for us to really rethink what is it that we are teaching our students? How are we preparing them to live in a society where chat GPT um, exists? And I believe this is going to change the way, chat GPT is going to change the way we do work within academia and outside academia. So it's already going to change the society. And I think the question has to border around how do we actually change the things that we teach or the things that we assess um, students to make them fit better into a society in which chat GPT exists. So in, in my comment, I think the conversation has mostly be, um, been around, um, let's rethink the learning outcomes. What are we, what do we want each student to get from the courses that we teach? And if we feel like if a student uses ChatGPT um, to, um, to have answers for an assignment and the learning outcomes of the course has been outsourced to a generative AI, then we are not doing things the right way. We are not meeting the learning outcomes. But if the learning outcomes are met and the student use, still use the, uh, um, a model, a generative AI model for part of the assignment, which doesn't necessarily fall into the learning outcomes, then this should be something something to embrace. So in my department, for example, most of the courses in information science, most of the courses are coding based. And there is very little about writing, although from time to time we give them some, we ask them to, to write reports and all of that, which means that actually the, the learning goals from our program is not to teach to them to be good writers. It's, it's not the central or the core part of, of our program. So if a student hand seen an assignment where they use um, a generative AI chat GPT to correct their grammatical mistakes, then we shouldn't be punishing them for, for, for doing that. Because again, coming back to the learning goals of, of our program, this is not really key to the learning outcome. So I think it's more of a, let's revisit the learning outcomes and make sure the way we assess, the way we teach, the knowledge we give to students all align with the learning outcomes and everything else that revolve around learning outcomes 
um, let's embrace the use of chat GPT if it's going to make students more productive. Thank you very much, Frank. So I hear here voices saying that it is actually pushing us to, to reflect on how we we, we operate today in the, the institution, whether it comes to teaching and learning, whether it comes to the assessment. Uh, is that something that you, 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 you see yourself in as well, Chris, or do you have a different uh, view on things here? Well, I want to build on what Kate and, and Frank have said, but I'll begin by, by saying that I have a history with this because I've been a faculty member for more than half a century and that means that I've lived through about nine hype cycles of AI. And so I've heard a lot of gee whiz predictions each high scoop, hype cycle, and I've heard a lot of doomsday predictions each hype cycle, and I have a healthy skepticism for, for gee whiz. Um, but certainly in every cycle, AI has gotten more powerful, but not as powerful as, as AI enthusiasts would claim. As a graduate student, I read the first published scholarly paper on AI in education in 1970, and the author confidently predicted we wouldn't need teachers in six years. And we've seen that that didn't turn out so well as a forecast. So it's important to keep a sense of perspective. It is true that this hype cycle has generated uh, something unexpected and that there is a lot of curiosity about what the summit, what the limits are of, of this unexpected attribute of large language models and what they mean. So um, let me talk about an immediate effect and, and a longer term effect. An immediate effect is a lot of concern about plagiarism, and that certainly is, is true at Harvard, and different faculty have different views on this. Uh, it may be the different schools at Harvard will have different views on this, but I, I have a view that is uh, perhaps different than many of my colleagues. So when we talk about learning, I'm not talking now about using generative AI in, in the workplace, but when we talk about someone who's trying to learn in an educational system, it's important to remember that what matters is not the destination, but the journey and that in fact, the destination is the journey. So it, we use proxies to measure whether or not students know something, a multiple choice test, a, an essay, uh, some other kind of production computer program. And if they produce the proxy, we say, well, they must have gone through the journey and learned. But of course, that's only true if you don't take a shortcut. And what plagiarism has been in the past has just having taking credit for the work of another human being uh, without citing them in in short circuiting the journey. Uh, there was an interesting news article in the US uh, this past month uh, about graduates from nursing schools. There were some bogus nursing schools that were set up in one of our regions and those bogus nursing schools Students paid a lot of money to learn how to take the national nursing exam. And they took the national nursing exam and they were, they were uh, licensed as nurses and they were hired. But then the hospitals and doctor's offices were really puzzled because they didn't know how to take blood pressure. They didn't know how to give a shot. They didn't know how to take vital signs. They didn't in fact know how to be a nurse. All that they knew was how to achieve the proxy. And that's the risk, I think, that we have with generative AI. Um, I'm going to quote from an article by um, Ted Chiang in, in a magazine here called The New Yorker. The article is called Chat GPT is a fuzzy JPEG of the web because I think he says it so well. He says, your first draft isn't an unoriginal idea expressed clearly. It's an original idea expressed poorly. And it's accompanied by your dissatisfaction, your awareness of the distance between what you, it says and what you want it to say. If you're a writer, you're going to write a lot of unoriginal work before you write something original. And the time spent on that unoriginal work isn't wasted. It's precisely what enables you to eventually write something original. 
the hours spent rearranging sentences and choosing the right words are what teach you how meaning is conveyed by prose. Having students write essays isn't merely a way to test their grasp of the material, it gives them experience in articulating their thoughts. And so what we risk when we say, um, well, you don't really need to draft the essay, just ask ChatGPT and then you can kind of add your own thoughts to what ChatGPT has done. That's a huge mistake in my opinion. Now, I'm not speaking here for any institution and I think that, that we have uh, many points of view about what plagiarism is and what, um, what learning is, but this is what I would say. And what I tell my students, frankly, is suppose you're, you're going for a job in marketing and when you get to the interview these days, the, the employer doesn't simply say, um, oh, what a nice resume you have and look at these great letters of recommendation. Uh, now employers are saying, I want you to write a marketing plan right here on the spot. I'll give you 30 minutes, here's your prompt and show me what you can do. But of course, then the employer is going to type the same prompt into ChatGPT. If you can't write a substantially better marketing plan than what comes out of the generative AI, you're not going to be hired because why hire somebody that you can get it for free? So that's the trap of sort of saying, I'm going to be as smart as generative AI by working in partnership with it. No, you, you want to be smarter, you want to be original. So, so there's an immediate question about just how you use it. And I would differentiate between using it for advice and using it for production. That's where this crucial journey and destination comes out. I, I've spent too long in an answer, but later in the interview, I want to talk about the work that I do with this National AI Institute on adult learning and online education and the concept of intelligence augmentation, IA rather than AI, that talks about what happens when humans and AIs work together productively. Thank you very much, Chris. And I think that your answer, although long, is also very well transitioning now into the next part of the questions because we had these two more general rounds. And now I would like to focus in more specifically on the impact on teaching and learning, going more into details on what it means for assessment, the impact on research. So going over more uh, thematic areas. And I think that you all three already broached this uh, in, term, in, in, in explaining, of course, how this tool is operating, Frank. I mean, in the sense that how fast those machines can process data, but there is limitations as well, as we heard from Chris and from Kate as well, to what it can do. It can process data. It can use statistical uh, calculations in order to predict certain things, but it can't add judgment. It can provide uh, a specific analysis. It cannot put things into context. And from what I understand in terms of the important role of universities and the, uh, the, the education that higher education institution is offering is those types of tools. So having generative AI, is it not just a way of actually saying that higher education is actually more important than ever to be able to learn how to have a critical mindset, learn how to analyze the data these types of machines are providing you to be able to uh, critically look at the, the, the sources. So with this comment, I would like to then now tune in a little bit on teaching and learning. Kate, and how do you think that AI is going to, to change teaching and learning? You already talked about the fact that it's kind of pushing us to, to think differently about how we do things, but maybe you can elaborate a bit further on that question. Sure. Um, I think uh, I think there are some broad categories where it um, you can talk about uh, the use of technology um, in higher ed, and we're always um, in need of good ways to give feedback, um, to do assessment, and think about innovative ways to do that um one of the things i'm enjoying so i think and i think there are people who are doing some really good research on what sort of feedback um 
question of AI could be giving students on their work, how to build that into the process, into their process of evaluating their own work. Um, if you're thinking about iterations through an essay or iterations through some sort of um, design task um, piece of work that they're doing. Uh, one of the things I'm really enjoying doing myself is just listening to so many practitioners, so educators, whether they're school educators or university educators, because um, I think we're still guessing a lot, like the technology is changing and our practice is changing. And there are, every time I talk to people, there is a new way that I have not thought of um, that someone is using this in their practice. Um, it could be to get a different perspective on a piece of work. So that wouldn't normally be part of a process. You might, you know, accidentally do that because you're telling someone about your piece of work, but to actually build that into a process of thinking about some piece of writing, um, that's a really powerful tool in terms of learning and learning to get different perspectives on work that you don't always have the opportunity to do as much as we would like for we've got these um we've got some good research to tell us how ideal learning environments should work in terms of collaboration in terms of tech access to technology access to teaching staff and all the rest um that doesn't always work out and so having tools there that can also work in similar ways in case the people part is not as reliable as um, we would like it to be, I think is really interesting to look at. Um, I think it's uh, another really interesting aspect of it is people using it to help them with communication. So um, I know lots of people at a very, uh, very easy example, lots of people using it to help them write emails, but also using generative AI to help them understand the tone of things that are being presented to them. So I can just see um, all of these impacts on how we help students learn how to do group work. If it, they're often very intangible things, they're difficult things for us to figure out what is potentially going wrong in a group. If there are tools that can help students do that management themselves. Um, but I think one of, one of the things is lots of people are really scared to use it. So um, I think getting, I, I teach a unit called um, Big Data and Learning Analytics to Masters of Education students. So they are teachers uh, who are doing a master's and uh, many of them in my unit this year, there's like 100 and, 120 students, um, had not used it because they were just worried about what it looked like, what they were going to put in there, um, whether it was gonna give them a right answer and so I think um, one of the impacts of it is to, again, it, it lets us reflect on, well, what is truth? What is it that we're expecting out of um, these models? What does risk mean when computer scientists are talking about risk, which is different in other fields? So I, I see it as very, I mean, there's lots of, I'm kind of with Chris on this, there's, there's lots of the impacts of this that are very similar to the impacts of other types of technology on learning and teaching um, it's just this one everyone is very excited about they would like to like to be part of and we've got universities kind of behind us implementing policies in a way that they don't usually do when it comes to technology and education thank you very much Kate for sharing that experience and I would like to continue with you uh, Frank here uh, because you were also sharing when we had the preparatory talk here um, that it also depends very much from discipline to discipline, of course. And what I'm hearing for Kate as well, it's also this, um, I mean, here right now in this room, you are experts, you're following the development, you invest quite a lot of time to actually uh, follow what is happening and, and form a, a, opinions, of course, based on the on the knowledge that you, you, you gain. But I mean, across the institutions, we have loads of different subjects and disciplines I think that, as you were saying, Frank, ChatGPT will exist in society. I think that students from all kinds of disciplines will actually make use of these types of tools, like they use a navigator, a browser to, to go collect information. So I think that it is going to be something that is going to be widely used. But then what is required within the institutions in order to maybe 
build the capacities, because that's also what you're alluding to, Kate, the, the necessary time to actually understand the potential of these tools and how it actually impact, impact your discipline, also if you're not in the area of AI or um, uh, new technologies. So, Frank, what is your experience on your, your end here? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to quickly also talk a bit about teaching sure. and um, how this the opportunities that this actually this tool actually present to uh, to us as teachers and to us as, as educators. Um, so last week I gave a similar talk and um, what one one of the things I did was to demonstrate how you can actually use ChatGPT depending on how you prompt it to develop a whole curriculum. Um, so I came up with a um, with a course that didn't exist at the university. And then I asked ChatGPT to come up with a curriculum and then suggest courses to teach for this one year master's program um, spread over two semesters. And it did it for each semester. It gave me suggestions on courses. And this is a course that is related to natural language processing. And with me as an expert, I looked at the topics that it was recommending. And then I was like, OK, this is this is not pretty far from from what we would teach in such such a program. And then I went on to ask it, OK, now that I have courses, take one course and then I want you to generate learning outcomes for this course. And then it did, and then I went on weekly topics um, spread over the entire semester for this particular course. And then it did lecture plans, assignment, generate grading criteria, rubric, it did, final exam. So it was to, a, to, to some extent able to generate all these. And if I think of us in academia, I think one of the comments that is very common is that teaching takes up all the time and there's very little time for research. But what we have now is a tool that can actually assist us in developing some of these materials. It requires expertise because um, what happens in developing some of these materials, especially using it as a lecture plan or using it for um, developing lecture is that it also make up stuff. It make up stuff that do not exist, um, non-factual things. So you need to first have, have the expert expertise to be able to, in that topic, to be able to actually get the best out of ChatGPT. So what we see is a tool that could be very beneficial and give us a lot of space, be a very good starting point in brainstorming on coming up with lectures, coming up with, with a course, developing a whole curriculum for, for an entire uh, research program. On the learning side, um, I, I think, um, Katie mentioned most of it, um, and also Chris, I think, hinted on some of them um, in the beginning. I think what I see to be the um, biggest challenge is the outsourcing of our ability to think, our ability to, to code, our ability to write. And as um, Chris um, mentioned, do we want to outsource the very things that define us as academics, the very things that define us as a student who has been through higher education. Do we want to outsource all of these to, to a generative AI? And just hypothetically, uh, imagine a student who has been through um, a whole bachelor's program or a whole master's program, use the generative AI throughout. He was never caught and then get a degree and at the end. The question is, is the degree worth anything um, if a student has gone through such such a process? But then again, uh, this brings us to the question of, you know, what, what are our learning outcomes? What do we really want to teach students? And I think it, we always have to go back to that. Um, what do we want to gain from our education? What do we want them to take um, at the end of, of, of their program? So, in also in, in my um, working group, chat GPT working group, trying to come up with a policy, um, what we, we've decided to do is that because there is so much diversity in the courses that are taught at the university, it's really difficult to use a bottom-up approach, which is the university coming up with a bigger policy and then the policy applying to all the courses. It's almost impossible because the courses are so different. So, um, what we what we are doing is that okay, let's handle this from a bottom bottom up let, let's use a bottom up approach right we ask each program each department to think about what is it that they want their student um, to be able to do at the end of their education at the end of their studies what are the learning objectives what are the learning goals and then build it up from there and then is there a space where we can then encourage student or even equip student to use a tool like a generative AI to make the most out of the learning objective. So you are using 
using AI, generative AI in this way, in this case, as just a tool to actually equip students to be more productive in order to or to be more efficient in order to meet the learning outcomes or the learning goals. And um, I think this approach for me, I personally like this approach because in the end, every department comes up or comes up with some sort of um, some sort of a mini policy, which will then develop into a bigger policy that will be applicable for the whole university. So again, I think the key point here is that um, whatever we want to teach the students, we want to make sure that they don't outsource this responsibility to a generative AI because we want them to be responsible agents in the society that we are preparing them um, to be part of. Yes, so part of the role as well is to make them understand the potential, but also the limitations to the, the, the tools that they're, they're using and, and how they're using it. Um, Chris, can I be provocative in the sense that now hearing Frank and saying you can actually use this as an assistant to build the curriculum and the, the, the learning plans, will higher education institution just become places where you buy your credentials that you need? Because, I mean, in theory, you could learn all that yourself if you have access to it. Or what is really the added value of higher education here when we have tools like um, ChatGPT available to us? Well, I've, I've worked with many learning technologies over my half century. And one thing that you can say about every single one of them is that these are double-edged swords. They can be used well, they can be used poorly. And I think that many of the proposed uses for generative AI are not very good uses, but that doesn't mean that it can't be used well and it can't be uh, solve some problems that we've had for a long time and make an exciting difference. So I'm going to express one more concern and then I'm going to be balanced by talking about what I see some of, as some of the real opportunities. Um, let, let's contrast chat GPT with the search engine, which, which is also uh, AI. It's not generative AI, although people are now adding generative AI into search engines. It's, it's a different kind of AI. It's a machine learning kind of AI. And um, it, at Harvard, we have wonderful reference librarians. And if you turn a reference librarian loose with a search engine, they can find all sorts of amazing sources that someone like me just using common terms with a search engine can't. So in contrast to when I started my career, when I would go to the library and wrestle with the Dewey Decimal System to try to find something that might be relevant. Now, you know, a skilled person with a search engine, a partnership with that kind of AI can find amazing and important stuff. But what I see students doing, and faculty too, for that matter, and lawyers, and, and so on, is thinking that the generative AI is like the reference librarian, that this is some kind of intelligence. It's going to do a search. It's going to know better than the search engine what you really want, because search engines, as you know, can send a lot of false hits. And it's going to select those for you and give you the answer that you want. And, and that's simply not the case. This is not like Skynet in the Terminator. This is not something with a consciousness that can think and plan and for better or for worse decide that it knows better than human beings. This is a large language model and as Frank said, it, it, its job is to complete sentences. That's, that's what it, its mission is. It's to complete sentences. So what you're doing is taking your own intelligence out of the loop by looking at what the search engine gives you and deciding which is relevant and how to combine them and turning all of that over to a generative AI. That's where generative comes from. The agency passes to the AI and it gives you, well, here's what you wanted. And of course, there are a lot of problems with that. Uh, there are problems with hallucinations because it will make up things because it doesn't understand what it's doing. So if if the next word is a word that leads you in a path that doesn't exist, it'll cheerfully go down that path. But also it replicates 
uh, I'm I'm on the advisory group for a major publisher, and other members of the advisory group are lawyers, both in in the U.S. and in Europe, and they deal with issues of intellectual property and issues of bias and issues of privacy. Uh, generative AI can give you back uh, up to 1,500 words verbatim from something that was fed into it, and um, what's fed in there's no regard to copyright there's no regard to intellectual property these companies are just throwing in everything on the web and so um if i don't get a hallucination what i may get is a curriculum that somebody else has already written the generative ai is simply regurgitating without any attribution so that's that's dangerous i mean that's that's really dangerous I think I think using generative AI to write references is malpractice. It has no idea who you're writing the reference for. I think that, that using generative AI to screen applicants for a university or applicants for a job is malpractice. It has no idea who these people are. It's just finding patterns. So having said all that, I don't want to come across as the grumpy old man that hates generative AI. What am I excited about? I'm excited about one of the things that Frank discussed, which is that this, this has actually solved the natural language processing problem. You can express to generative AI anything using idioms, using paraphrasing, using uh, unusual terms, and it will understand what you're saying, understand in the sense that it will make an appropriate response, not understand in the way that we would understand. And that's a big deal because now for many tools, you can do natural language processing across the full range of languages and, and interact in a whole different way, a way that makes that tool much more accessible to you. That's a really big deal. And there is a company called Wanda, W-O-N-D-A, I'll put a, a link into the chat, that is doing really interesting things with chatbots with backends from generative AI for language learning and for creating language learning situations where context and culture are important. I've worked with my colleague, Professor Nicole Mills at Harvard on this. She's head of the Department of Romance Languages. But the other thing that I'm excited about is that generative AI can take over routine parts of some work. Now, I'm not talking about learning now where you can short circuit the journey. I'm talking about in the workplace when you already know what you're doing, you can use generative AI to help you with, with routine parts of your work. And that's where this concept of intelligence augmentation comes in, that when just as with other forms of automation, when you um, are able to uh, turn over routine parts of work, you can be de-skilled by that if you don't choose to do anything more yourself, or you can upskill. And now you can do all the things that generative AI can't. And I'll give you just one quick example, because I know that this isn't a lecture. Um, Science fiction has long thought about intelligence augmentation, although it hasn't used that term. Some of you may be fans of Star Trek, The Next Generation. Uh, and if so, you know that Captain Picard is the wise human being who runs the starship. And Data is the android, who uh, the machine, who looks like a human being, but who in fact is a computer with artificial intelligence. And the two of them form a really effective partnership because Data can ingest far more data and make all sorts of calculative predictions with it. But Picard is the human being that has wisdom, that knows how to apply the predictions in a reasonable way. And what, what we're doing now in education is we're training people to lose to AI because our measure of success is things like high stakes tests and descriptive essays that AI can do is it's part of the intelligence augmentation. What we need to be doing is shifting our outcomes to judgment, the things that AI can't do. And, and until we make that shift, we're kind of automating 
the wrong things to teach to students in this brave new world of generative AI instead of innovating to take advantage of how we can teach the right things to students. Thank you very much, Chris, for adding both the, the concerns and some of the, the, the challenges before us in terms of how these tools can be, as you say, either used for good or misused. And I'm just thinking, is that not one of the reasons why educating students about these tools, the limitations to those tools and the opportunities, how it can be used, is that not part of the role of universities today then as part of the learning process, I would say more or less across the, dis the different disciplines um, in order to, to avoid that. I mean, I also see questions uh, in the, the Q&A about uh, integrity, academic integrity. What is the way forward now? Are we going to rely on being able to trust humans to use those tools for good, to educate humans to use the tools for good, or are we going to try to get rid of them? That's not what I'm hearing from you. I hear this is something that will exist in society, whether we adopt it or not within higher edge, the walls of higher education uh, institutions. Um, so, so what do we do in order to um, make sure that there is the necessary knowledge about the use and also for the students to be prepared and know how to act. What can they do? What can they not do uh, in terms of, of using these tools? I mean, we have different uh, types of exams as well, depending on the disciplines, the depending on the numbers, as you were saying, uh, Kate, as well, when it comes to assessment, because it's about scaling up and we have limited resources uh, in order to sometimes do what we would actually prefer to do. But what would your advice be in terms of integrating this uh, within higher education institutions and um, as part of the curriculum and, uh, in different disciplines? Is that something that you see for the future? Kate, I'll start with you this time. Um, one of the things I think, because I think it is, um, it is being used in people's lives and workplaces. And so um, one of the things I think is important is to acknowledge the way in which the students are using it. So not make it a you can or you can't use it, but in what way have you used it to inform your thinking? Um, I was talking to someone just last week who uh, has adopted it in the referencing style that the students need to use in the, I think they were doing lesson plans or something. And so they they cite that it that the idea or whatever it is came from chat GBT and in the reference list they put the prompt that they used. So I think some of it is about um, that helps students understand how they're connecting that information and using other information as well from searching from other sources, all of that, and they're putting it together. So I think that's really powerful way to do it. That's certainly how we're looking at it in the like in the research space as well um, with the journal that I'm one of the editors of. It's really about acknowledging how people are using it to develop the ideas that they have. Um, and so I think if it's it, if we're thinking back to it being an authentic assessment um, and trying to do things at scale, that that would be like the bare minimum of you actually don't have to change too much about what you're doing. You just it's just another source um, that people are drawing on. But then we can be thinking about um, broadening the way that we are, um, that, that the AI is interacting with the students and how they're developing knowledge. Um, but just one thing to acknowledge in all of that when it comes to assessment, when it comes to any of these things, is that universities are so slow to change, at least in Australia. So, um, and particularly uh, at some disciplines more than others. So, you know, teacher education in Australia is uh, something where there are um, accreditation processes that exist nationally as well. So to change any part of the assessment process can take years. So I think in the meantime, while we're thinking about all of these great ideas for, for some disciplines, we need to figure out ways that we can incorporate it into current practice um, as well. 
Yes, thank you, Kate. So this is, of course, also a challenge in terms of the national policies, in terms of the the, the traditional ways of operating, and then how to 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 change that. Um, Frank, in terms of uh, assessments, uh, are there other things that you see uh, beyond the points that have already been mentioned here that you that you see that would need to change, or some advice that you would give in terms of? Um, I mean, is it the end of essays and dissertations for assessments or, I mean, do we have to think differently or can we also set up rules like for some exams you are allowed to use books or calculators or, and then we can also say yes or no, you're allowed to use uh, chat GPT as one of the tools to for your exam is what you see as, as the way of coming about to some of the challenges here. Yeah, I think I would approach it in two two ways uh, before I talk about the assessment of thesis, for example, specifically. Um, I think the first issue here, the first issue that we are dealing with here um, has to do with, do we even trust our students to responsibly use this technology? For me, I see this to be the key question because when, when, when this was launched and all of a sudden we were shocked that, you know, we have this technology among us, which students can easily copy from. I think the immediate conclusion, at least from the reaction I saw around was that we actually don't trust our students uh, because they are going to cheat, because they are going to copy, because they are going to take things from chat GPT and then present them as their, uh, as their own um, work. And I think this raises, for me, it raises is a further question and a very important one. What is it that we are teaching our students? I think one of the key things we want students to take from higher education is academic integrity, that we are raising uh, students who would be out there, whether in academia or outside academia, to exercise this integrity, this transparency. What, wherever you take something from, right? Google has been in existence for a very long time. If you take something from Google, if you take something from a book you read at the library, if you take something from a blog post, you have to cite it, you have to reference it, reference it if it's not your own idea. So for me, the, the reaction that all of a sudden we can't trust our students anymore and uh, they are going to cheat, they are going to take things from chat GPT, for me sort of uh, brings up this issue of perhaps again we are not teaching our student um, to uphold academic academic in integrity and i also believe that we should include students in this discussion i think much of it has been among we the staff um, you know how do we deal with this how do we prevent students from cheating without hearing from students what do students really want how do students see this and uh, including them in, in in the process of policy to make. And I think that's really important. On the second part, which has to do with dissertations, I think I, I'm personally not so worried about, about that. I don't believe you can use chat GPT to write a whole dissertation. And anyone who is going to be able to do that actually needs to first have an expertise in that topic to be able to write a whole thesis with chat GPT and get a very good grade for it. Um, because it's going to be very shallow. It's going to make up things. It's going to give you um, references or citations that do not exist and it means that for every output you are going to take from chat gpt to include in your thesis you would have to spend time reading on that particular topic to check if the output you are getting from chat gpt is actually correct so i think anybody who would go on this path would end up becoming an expert on that topic uh, by using chat gpt and then cross-checking its output with with real and actual um, research papers and doing proper um, citations and all of that so i yeah i personally i'm personally not worried about about thesis and i think as i mentioned earlier on if my student is using it to correct um, grammatical um, errors, to correct typos with content being intact. So a student has written the context, not sure of the grammatical uh, mistakes in the output. For me, this is not problematic as long as they also reference that chat GPT was used to correct the grammatical um, errors. I actually experimented this in one of the courses I taught, I taught last semester where I said to my students, uh, so I made up the assignment in a way that they could not use directly use chat GPT. Um, and then I said to them, if you happen to use chat GPT, make sure you cite it um, 
um, reference it that I used chat GPT for this part of the assignment to do this specific task and all of that. And to my surprise, three students did use chat GPT and then they acknowledged it um, as well that they used it. And for me, this I was happy to see that because at least they were transparent about how they used it. And the way they used it wasn't to get or generate a content, which was actually not possible because of how I structured the assignment. Um, so I, I think the issue here has to be has to do with are we teaching students uh, to be transparent? And um, if we are scared that they are going to teach, then perhaps we should revisit this goal that we want to teach our students to be transparent with wherever they are getting their ideas and their output from. So actually, well, we hear some saying that uh, tools like uh, ChatGPT will be undermining the, the academic values. Maybe on the other hand, it's actually calling for a reinforcement of those academic values to be at the center because with those as the guiding or steering wheel, then you can use tools as ChatGPT being aware of their limitations or not. I think that also makes us shift into the conversation about uh, the, the information that is used during these tools. Chris, of course, I'll give you the floor now, but and you can still comment on the assessment part, but I know you already started that in the end of your previous uh, a round of comments. So I also want to, to bring in this time the question about reliability, accuracy, representation of the data that comes in in this tool, the, the biases uh, that may be generated here. What role for higher education here? I mean, we cannot necessarily control the amount of data that is being used in those tools. What is the role of higher education here to, to discuss these types of, I mean, Chris, in your introduction, you called it a, a foggy mirror, which I really thought was a nice allegory as well, because the way that I see the information in ChatGPT basically is the, the, the digital human products that are being re-given to us in some way. But the, the problem is that not necessarily in all parts of the world, we have the same level of digital content. So what is at stake here uh, for higher education as well, Chris? Well, let's, let's talk for a minute about um, dissertations and comprehensive exams. Because for a doctoral student, you have a, a written and oral comprehensive exam that isn't about regurgitating what you've read. It's about synthesizing what you've read and experienced and forming an original opinion about it, your opinion about it, rather than just quoting everybody else's opinion about it. And a dissertation is supposed to be an original contribution to knowledge. Now, I started by saying that ChatGPT and, and generative AI is moonlight, not sunlight. Um, if we turn off the sunlight, the moonlight is going to quickly fade and um, the, the human contribution of originality and extension of knowledge is the sunlight. So we certainly don't want to say, well, we've got chat, uh, generative AI now, we don't need this, this sunlight. Our moon is going to take care of us. <laughs> That's not, not how it works. And, and so we need to think about keeping performance assessments. So um, I and colleagues build virtual worlds uh, in which students can learn ecosystem science by entering the virtual world as an avatar, just like an internet game, and experiencing a virtual ecosystem and performing as an ecosystem scientist would. And then, you know, you look at the kind of summative products that they produced and the kind of step-by-step -step uh, formative uh, actions that they took, and you can assess what they knew, know and don't know about inquiry and ecosystem science and so on. Um, that's a kind of assessment that generative AI cannot do. It's not a psychometric, you know, find the right answer embedded in tempting wrong answers proxy. It's, it's actually the behavior that you're trying to measure. And there are there are um, systems now for producing different kinds of practice environments and summative assessments 
that I think are very interesting and powerful. For example, I'm an advisor to a company called Mersion, and that's like a flight simulator for human skills. And so we're looking at Mersion to teach negotiation. We're looking at Mersion to teach um, teachers how to um, be equitable in how they distribute classroom discussions and personalize learning to each student and so on. So we should be keeping our assessments that involve creation and that involve not proxies, but direct performance of what people are going to be doing in life and throw out the ones that are proxies that generative AI can do well on. Anything that generative AI can do on a test, it's going to do in the workplace. That's going to go into the AI part of the job. And so then we'd better be teaching people what they can perform. So what are the kinds of bias? Um, one of the things is that um, AI as a large language model is limited to whatever was put into its training and, um, and aligned through the process that Frank described. And as the world changes and things like new words come along, or as the alignment that was performed becomes different. And an example of everything changing would be the pandemic, for example. That AI is a pre-pandemic trained AI is dead as a doornail the minute that the pandemic comes along because it, it has to be redone from scratch um, in terms of the training that it receives. So we don't live in the kind of stable world where we can train an AI and say, okay, it isn't going to adapt. It isn't going to grow. It's going to be what, what, what you put in is what you get out. There's also issues with um, words themselves. And an interesting example is the word not. So we use the word not frequently in natural language. It's an important way of expressing things. Not is very difficult for lang large language models. Because if you say a dog is, the large language model can find all sorts of stuff that a dog is on the web and use those words to answer. If you say a dog is not, well, a dog isn't a shoe, but that may not be a useful thing to say, right? A dog is not president of the United States. That may not be a useful thing to say. And so it sort of frantically searches for knots that if it can't find knots for dogs, it finds them for pets. And so you can say a dog is, is um, not good at, at repeating things like a parrot. Well, I mean, so. That, that's not something that people think about in terms of dogs. So it, even in its understanding of, of what human beings are saying to it, it's understanding and how to give a good response between um, outright plagiarism through um, copying things that it was trained on, uh, hallucinating in different ways, uh, auto-completing in, in random ways when it hits a word like not, it's, it's, it's problematic. And, um, and it's problematic to use. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, my word processor does is what's called auto-completion. You know, you're typing and it suggests what you want to do next. That's a very dangerous thing. I always turn off auto-completion. Let's say I'm writing a recommendation letter and this thing is busy auto-completing for me. I'm, I'm being biased unconsciously towards what it says. I have to consciously say, no, that isn't right and delete it as opposed to just hitting tab and moving on. That's, that's something sitting on your shoulder whispering in your ear. I would be very careful about what you have whispered into your ear. So um, I think there's a lot of reasons to be cautious about the weaknesses of these large language models in addition to their strengths.
Thank you very much, uh, Chris. What about you, Kate? And in terms of the, the the data, I mean, you and Chris come from countries where English is the primary language, I think, at least for, for most um, uh, people, or at least part of the, the, the language used in schools where Frank and I, not necessarily. Um, so what does this mean as well, that we have different languages, different cultures, different representations? What, what does it mean in terms of the type of answers that we are getting is, is it going to influence the way we perceive the world in a way that is actually limited to a biased way of production of digital outcome? Because this is actually how we operate in the real world and it's then mirrored through these systems and, and what can we do here is should it be part of the, the education cycle as well. Um. Yeah, I think it's absolutely a risk in terms of the diversity of the data that the models are drawing on um, and definitely you know, English language being the that primary source of it. And if you then think about who is producing that text, so even if you're talking about English language speaking countries, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that those countries are generating a lot of the text that these models draw on. So um, I think that if they're then using that to make predictions about what, um, how the world is being seen, how, how, what the answers are to these questions, um, then we're not getting a diversity of views. We're getting um, one couple maybe views <laughs> from putting it together. Um, but I think uh, one of the um, interesting things I heard about just the other week, I was at a conference um, for the learning sciences, so the science of how people do learning, and some of the universities in the US are talking about the universities having a responsibility to create databases or the data that models would then draw on. So I think that there are steps being taken to try and um, address that at least. I think there were... I. I see it as a really big problem. So I think it's a really big um, topic to be talking about with students if they're critically, if they're looking at um, the, the answers that they're getting from their prompts to not only be looking at it in terms of, well, does the sentence make sense? Is it hallucinating all the rest? But so what assumptions sat behind the data that this is drawing on? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Kate. I also want to pose this question to you, Frank, uh, with your experience, both in the, the generation, but uh, also from your own life experience. Um, yeah, um, so a, a few things to, to mention. I think um, the first one has to do with, so the question has to do with um, the fact that it can skew um, information or the fact that it can manipulate information for some specific um, interest. So first of all, it has to do with um, the data. So this has been trained on data produced by humans. And uh, a lot of times, whatever it's going to give you is based on the data. So if I should give you an exercise right now to go on Google and then um, search for professor, you would have to scroll. You may have to scroll before you can find a female professor in there. So almost everything, if you look at the images, almost everything it's going to give you will be, will be men, male dominant. This is because the problem is coming from the data. The other important thing has to do with the question of these models are being created by companies who are in for profit in Silicon Valley's, Silicon Valley. And I'm not sure if we want ideologies and um, you know interests of Silicon Valley to be represented in the society. I'm not sure to put it in different ways. I'm not sure if we can trust Silicon Valley with the instruction they put into the model uh, for society to use at large. Because the, to, to build the model, actually part of chat GPT, which is GPT 3.5, um, is, is based on instruct GPT, 
Um, and what they do, what you would do is in all of these parameters, you give it some sort of instructions on what to say, what not to say, um, what is a no go, what is a go, and all of that. And if you have, um, you know, guys working on Silicon Valley, giving these sort of instructions to these models, I'm not sure if it's the right way uh, to go about it. And then on the topic of uh, inequality, um, which has to do with, you know, the fact that about 92% of all the data on which we don't know for sure because OpenAI was not very transparent about the exact data they used, but at least we can infer from the data they used from GPT-3 based on which we had chat GPT, 92.5% um, of such data is from English. There are other languages involved as well. And if the idea of, you know, every language comes with it, its culture, and again, it goes back to um, the comments I made earlier on, and I think Chris also mentioned that, right, if, if the language we get from this model come with a specific culture, then again, we should be cautious on what the model actually say to us, right? It can lead you on a path easily. But at the same time, um, if, if language again comes with culture and the training data is mostly based on English with its particular or peculiar culture, and then this model being made accessible to you know everyone across the globe. I, I, I'm not sure if it helps with the inequality problem we already have. If you have a model which is being trained with 92.5% of its data coming from one specific language with one specific culture, how about the other languages? I mean, if you look at 10 years from now, if we if we should think of advancement in technology, and then you you sort of imagine one specific technology being shaped by one single culture. I mean, who even decides or who, who even determines that that is the right culture uh, to make accessible to, to, to all people across the, across the globe. So the idea of um, inequality already exists in our society, but having models like this are only going to exponent this type of um, in inequalities. One thing I did the other day was to hypothetically come up with um, with a non-factual non event in Ghana. So I talked about, I gave the prompt, can you describe to me how um, Great Hall, which is one of the halls at my alma mater in Ghana, University of Ghana, was destroyed by an earthquake in 100 words. And ChatGPT did. It described how the hall was destroyed by an earthquake years back. But this is not true. This, this doesn't exist anywhere. And the reason is because it had only very little data being trained in English again from Ghana. It may be the same for someone from Sri Lanka. It may be the same for someone from Lithuania. Um, so this inequality is only going to get um, wider. And if it's in the hands of people who are in for business, um, then yeah, I, I don't see much uh, much hope for the, for, the, for the future unless we do something about this. Thank you very much, Frank, for, for, for pointing that out to us as well. And I think that you are pointing to something that is, of course, also of my concern personally. It is the commercial and the political interest that can be then injected into these data tools and that could screw or bias the information that we're actually using. But is that not one of the reasons why, again, higher education has a key, key role to play here? As you were saying, Frank, as well, that that we are aware of the limitations to those tools and that we try to optimize the, 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 the opportunities. Chris, you were mentioning some of the examples that you were saying that this is actually exciting for learning and this is how we can actually use these tools to, to enhance the quality of, of teaching and learning. But we also have to be very aware of some of the, the limitations to the data that we're using and the potential uniformization of the, the understanding of the, the world that could come through biased uh, information in the world. I actually saw in one of the, um, I think, interviews with um, Sam Altman from OpenAI, and he himself was calling for a similar entity like um, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was set up at the time that nuclear technology became something that was considered a, a potential human or threat to humanity. 
maybe in this last round, and then we have to, 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 to round off this very exciting conversation, even though there is a lot of questions that we could continue a debate. But is this something that we would need? Is this something where we have a, I mean, this goes a bit beyond the domain of higher education, but at the same time, it also impacts higher education in terms of the societies that we interact with. Do we need like an international regulating body so that it's not left within the hands of commercial interest to develop these types of technologies? Is that one solution in order to try to fix the problem in terms of the data, the representation, inequality, and then actually maybe enhance uh, those tools? Or is that uh, utopia and is never going to happen? Chris, I give you the, the floor here. Well, <clears throat> I, I worry about regulatory bodies in a different way than I worry about political groups or um, you know, commercial groups. But they, regulatory bodies have their problems too. I think that, that this should be something that everybody talks about and that everybody develops opinions about and that, and that bottom-up initiatives advocate for different ways of thinking about it. I don't want to delegate uh, my trust to any small organization, whether it be Silicon Valley, you know, the US government or a regulatory body. I, I think that we have the tools now with the internet and remote interaction to be able to do better than that. Um, but I do worry about, um, if we're not very thoughtful, throwing the baby out with the bathwater with this technology. And to build on what, what both Kate and Frank said, which was terrific, um, languages are ways of thinking. Uh, a different language is not simply using different symbols to say the same thing or using different sounds to say the same thing. It's a way of thinking that comes out of context and culture. And so making any advising device multilingual is a risk, as they have said. And also, you know, sort of saying, well, now that we've got fluent translation, let's just do everything in English and translate everything from the other languages and they'll gradually just vanish because we'll all speak the same thing. That's a terrible mistake as well. So we, we really, really have to think deeply about what we're doing, which may be a good thing. It may be that in trying to avoid these dangers, that we actually find better ways to do what we're doing now. Thank you very, very much, uh, Chris. Kate, over to you. Um, just a really quick one on this. So the two roles I sort of see, I'm okay with some regulations, mostly because I can see it can help people know how to use these tools in a safe way in a productive way um we've had some recent a uh, recent article just come out that was a survey of australian students and a lot of them didn't use chat gpt this year so far because they just didn't know if they were allowed to or what the rules were so some regulations that's the micro stage um level but some regulations i don't think are a, a terrible thing but i think part of the role of higher education is that we're preparing the people who in the future are going to be making these laws. So um, looking at the changes in systems, developing all of these approaches to it. So yeah, all of this um, that we've all been talking about, about preparing people to be critical thinkers around it and actually understand what's going on is going to mean that they can participate in society um, in making decisions around this in the future. Thank you, Kate. You get the last words here. Yes, um, so two quick things. Uh, first one has to do with, I think uh, Chris also mentioned it um, a while back, has to do with the fact that in these models, there is something in natural language processing we call black box. So we actually don't know how these models um, learn. We can speculate about it. There are 
people who are now doing research on this, but there is this big black box which we don't know. Now, what makes it worse is that on top of that, there is also lack of transparency from the companies that make these models. So OpenAI, for example, hasn't made it public. It's not open source. We have no idea of the data sets, um, how it was trained and all of that. And that makes it worse. So this is where I see regulation being very, very important that if um, regulators would require, um, legally require these companies to disclose how they built these models, I think that would then be very important. And that ties into my next point, which is the role of higher education or the role of research institute in this. If these models are made transparent, then the next step, I believe, is to equip research institutes or educators to actually, you know, with investment in, in infrastructure to be able to build and evaluate such such models. So recently, my university got um, so that the way we the way these models are trained is that they are trained on a cluster of supercomputers. So um, you take um, like 100 supercomputers, you put their power together, and then you'll be able to train one model. So Microsoft, for example, built something specific for, 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 for this cluster of computers. So we got um, a new cluster of computers um, for training large language models and other tasks as well. And if we compare, if we should train like a model like ChatGPT4 or GPT4 on our computer cluster, it will take us 64 years. OpenAI did this in one month to three months. So you can see that we are already, research institutes are already way behind what the companies are doing. So if we can have some sort of investment infrastructure um, in research, um, in people, in, in education, then we can be able to, in a way, be in a better position to evaluate um, the harms, the biases, and all the ins and outs of some of these models that are on the market and already have their influence on the society. So thank you. And I see that unfortunately we have come to an end. We are running out of time. It has been a fantastic uh, um, session. I mean, it's been a great pleasure for me to, to listening to all three of you, to thank you for sharing your views, uh, your expertise. I think that we have not provided absolute answers to everything here, but we have broached a lot of important topics, showed some of the opportunities, some of the, the qualities. Uh, I think that there was agreement to some extent that this is going to be part of society, whether higher education embarks on that road or not. Uh, so it's also a matter of then adapting uh, to society. And then, as you were saying, Frank, maybe call for more transparency for universities to not only be engaged in terms of educating the students, being knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the limitations or opportunities of those tools, but also understanding longer term impact, being able to do uh, research uh, on the impact and to inform uh, policy making, hopefully, as you were also referring to Kate through as well, the, the students uh, exiting the university. I think that this is only the first conversation about AI uh, and the impact on higher education from our side at IAU. I think that it is a topic that will come back in different forms, but I was very pleased to have you three with me here today. So I thank you all and I thank all the participants for being with us and from listening in. And I look forward to continuing the conversations beyond this webinar. So thank you to all three of you. Bye. All right. Thank you for having us. Bye. Thank you.